everyone. So I see a lot of tired faces. This is good, but the level of energy is still quite high, I can guess. It's been amazing so far, and I, we are all looking forward to hearing your pitching session. Now, just a reminder uh, about what comes from now on. Um, so, following the pitching sessions, there will be statements slash feedback of challenge providers. So, I would encourage all the challenge providers to, you know, uh, reflect on what they hear about the challenge about the solution and uh, provide a, a, a feedback or statement related to that. Then afterwards, we are going to um, have an apparel. We will start around 6 o'clock. Hopefully, we can keep up with this schedule. Otherwise, uh, you'll be all informed. Uh, then at half past 6, we are going to open the uh, awards and closing session. So I would like to invite the first team on stage, which is ACT team and they resolved or solved the challenge from Vega. The challenge was about the active actigraph. So please, the uh, presenter is welcome to come on stage. Just one second. So thank you, Gurmit. This stage is yours. Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 yes. So you're awake. My name is Grumit Sandhu. I'm with Andreas we from the group called uh, Artem, and there are four of us, Marco and Yomi. So both Andreas and myself will present. So our presentation is looking, or our task is looking at recognizing which daily uh, living activities is performed by people using an artigraph uh, devices which is uh, an accelerometer if you're not familiar with it. So this is an overview of what really is a very complicated process. Uh, you can see a human figures and those sides pointing out. Over here is where you can actually put different kind of meters. And in this particular data set, it is on the ankle and it's on the uh, hip. Now there are basically four different sort of measurements that you can use. Uh, an accelerograph was one, and a gyrometer. And a gyrometer, for people who are not familiar, is when you actually tilt and tend, and certain movements do that. And uh, it goes into feature extraction, and you can see there's a, a 
green lighting bit because that's actually what we did. Uh, instead of using the accelerometer, we also include the gyrometer, and Andres will go through this. Uh, we also look at feature extraction, uh, extraction. We also look at machine learning algorithm. And on the right side, upstairs, you're looking at windows of interval of movements. And this was all very new for me. Basically, it generates a lot of data. In nine volunteers, it's about 2.7 million data points that were generated. So you can see one of the issues that we have to deal is the enormous amount of data and actually try to make sense out of it. So that's basically a very short overview of how you can assess daily act physical activities, monitor, measure, and method, the three M's. Now on my right hand side, there are 69 uh, different activities of uh, daily activity, including eating breakfast. These were developed in the 50s and 60s, and you can see some of them like vacuuming, as we get robots coming in, are going to be redundant. So this is something that we also have to face with technology. So basically, over here uh, in, in the study, it was divided into 11. And out of those 10, 14% make 69%. And you can imagine 85 or 86% fall into others. So this is something that we, we have to look at. It's a crossover design, there is group A and B, and daily activities were conducted once per day. This is to give you the big picture, and you see how much it's truncated already, and the large amount of data that's collected. Uh, there are five tasks, I'm not going to go that in detail. So this slide really is for you, Andreas, I hope you're looking at this. So this is looking at how we connect knowledge, which includes the human movement, kinesiology, we're looking at health research. We actually had to request data so we can calculate their BMI, which is body mass index, that was not given to us. I come from a life science background. That's most probably also what's driving it. And also, uh, quite interestingly, uh, what I call social or false know-how, we had to teach Andreas about Martha Stewart, who's an American woman who tells about your standards of housekeeping. So for someone like Andreas, he actually learned you need to dust before you vacuum. So there are a couple of things that we had to reach out. So, on, so knowledge doesn't always sit within the university. Sometimes we have to reach out to other kind of knowledge bit. Uh, there's a red line here because not all the knowledge could be transferred effectively to what was given here for the biomedical engineering. And then here we've got machine learning and uh, deep learning. So Andreas will talk about feature engineering, the different learning methods and how to proceed. Uh, my particular bias, a point I want to make is the sample is very biased. In the nine volunteers, there were no women. So again, we are perpetuating this AI bias by excluding women. Uh, I don't understand why that has happened. And also the division of uh, overweight, underweight, and healthy weight as calculated by the BMI was very artificially predefined. So you can see that the researcher had already predefined this. So I believe now I'm going to hand over to Andreas to finish through the presentation. I'll see you at the end. So also hello from my side. Um, yeah, we actually started with um, an intra-volunteer prediction. So that means we just took one patient out of it and just tried to train a model to actually uh, recognize his activities, right? And we were given raw data and also pre-processed data. So we started with the pre-process to really get fast. And yeah, let's say this model kind of worked. So I mean, the different walking styles, like walking fast, slow, and so on, uh, we could recognize these ones very good, but the cleaning tasks, they failed. So we had to get to other, med uh, other uh, models. So we extended that and just started to use like a, a, an ankle, um, sensor with a hip sensor and try to combine them and use them both and it improved a little bit but still it was kind of worse for cleaning um, so then we actually started to change why we had these two second intervals and this was our major step then in the end so we reprocessed the data again with a 10 second interval so we used a really longer interval in the end 
and yeah, just computed some statistic values, used them, and this kind of was our key step because that solved everything in the end because then we could use easy models um, and get pretty, really pretty good results. I will show you afterwards. Um, so when we got upon this step, um, we also try to do inter-volunteer predictions, right? So getting across all the patients. And obviously when you take a model for person X, it doesn't work for person Y. So we trained again all the patients and tested it. And that awesomely good worked. Um, so we had, didn't have to do anything special about it. Um, what have you mentioned again here? Yeah, you will see that. So what I actually have to say, while you can look at this, we took like a 10 second interval of each activity and applied a window over it. So you have to think of, they recorded um, the activities um, for a long time, let's say two minutes, they did the same activity. And we take a 10 sec second interval out of it, shift it by a second, and this is our um, next new activity. And yeah, we trained the model. It was just a random forest. I think 100 trees, um, max depth of 18. And yeah, you see the result. It's amazingly good, right? So the classification was across the... No, this, was, this is intra. So that means for a single patient, it works really good. And actually the result for inter-volunteers is also amazingly good. We have like a F1 score of 0 0.98. Also, 98%, and this is too high to believe. And yeah, I still don't believe the numbers because they're just so good. But um, yeah, we would have to verify that, that further. But it seems like that this interval of 10 seconds performs very well for these tasks. And that's a key point in the end. Um, yeah, I think we have to go, we have to finish fast, right? So probably Gourmet here. So in summary, in a concluding slide, uh, we were given five uh, tasks. We've all achieved them, so you can see the ticks in there. We look at inter reducing inter-volunteer uh, predictions, intra. We're looking at reducing the amount of uh, data that's used because the large amount of data is collected, and also reducing the false positive. So some of the things that we've learned, uh, you, you know, Andres has pointed out, creating 10 second intervals. Uh, my personal uh, point to make is a bias sample is not reflective of the real world data setting. I think Knut and uh, Andres have mentioned about the AI winter that's coming, and if we continue to behave like this, we are going to perpetuate this uh, AI winter again. <laughs> Um, and also, I think uh, how we work, I think, uh, I think we want to, I sh should say we should bring the human movement, the kinesiology earlier in the process. We started the programming back. Um, and also, I think uh, to, to underscore what Andreas uh, has said, that maybe more time to validate our findings, uh, because they're actually very promising and, and look very good. And with that, I, I'd like to thank you. And I guess whether you would take question, have questions for us, or you move to the next presentation. We can, we can welcome questions. Thank you. But first of all, thank you very much for this speech. <laughs> Is there any question? Yes. Uh. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Quick question, why did you choose this 10 second window? Did you play around with the window size or is there any specific uh, reason why you cho chose 10? It was luck. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first choice and it worked. Well, you can go, actually we try to go down to eight to six. Um, it gets a little worse and at some point it just will fail, right? So two seconds, it will totally fail. But 10 seems to be pretty good. So pure luck. <laughs> any further question? No. Okay. Thank you again, Gurmit and Andreas. Amazing job. So now let me prepare the stage for group two.
staff house. I would like to invite Randall on stage and they solve the challenge posed by Post Finance. Test oh, goes. So just a few th seconds, a few seconds of suspense before we listen to this challenge, the solution, sorry. I can, can try to start right now then. I would say yes. Cool. Let's start. Thank you, Ran. So hello, everyone. Uh, we are Team Staff House. We took the challenge from Post Finance and we went so deep into it that we forgot that we had a presentation almost. But we were able to, <laughs> to scrap it together. So the problem was uh, cybersecurity. Usually we have like a, a problem, uh, a vulnerability problem, one every 90 minutes. And uh, since the web goes so fast, you never know what's going to come next. And big companies usually uh, are vulnerable to, this thing, to these things. Uh, almost 85% of the companies don't actually patch their problems in time uh, because maybe they don't search for it or they don't seem it's relevant. But then sometimes they like suffer the consequences. And uh, Post Finance wanted to go ahead with it and like, hopefully find a solution. So we tried to do like a couple of approaches to it. Uh, first one was not artificial intelligence actually, but it was the comparison uh, from, from data. Basically, we, I can show another, the next slide. Uh, the CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposures. So basically there's a list which is uh, designed in a certain format in well-known websites and where you can go and search uh, a new, a new vulnerability that comes out. So basically, it's the name of the producer, of the producer that is can might be Oracle, for example, uh, the version, and so on and so on. And Post Finance has like this internal C, C, uh, CPEs that are already configured in there. So one approach was making a JSON a API. I mean, we found it online, we configured it. So basically, it goes to these websites, it takes the information. It compares it with what the company would have inside, and if it has a match, then it shows that there is a match. So basically, a new, uh, a new problem came out, uh, a potential problem, because then the manager needs to check it by himself and see that is, if the threat is relevant or not, uh, which is an inter interesting solution, because normally uh, when, for example, by Oracle, they, they put it out in their news after there is a solution out after they found the problem. But in these websites, there is a little bit, you get the news beforehand, which means you can prepare yourself before that uh, something worse or bad can happen. Uh, and then we got a second approach, which is with machine learning. Uh, there was very little time to be able to find an actual uh, solution to that, but we had the first approach and we did some little tests. So. Going to the second approach, basically we get data from public sources, like it might be Twitter, it might be web, uh, websites, or even the dark web, 
the scary place. We go take some uh, machine learning algorithm from Azure, since we use it right now. It's like a cognitive test analytic, so it basically analyzes texts uh, from, from different inputs. It uses a Levenstein similarity algorithm, which I don't exactly know in detail what exactly it does, but it's helpful. And in the end, if it finds a solution, it basically sends an alert. So let's go to the first uh, point. It was the input data. We tried it with Twitter. So basically, we, we took some keywords. We put it inside the script. Uh, we were able to create a developer account in Twitter and use some authentication keys, which were specific for, for this kind of usage. And uh, the algorithm found in the end, oh, I'm actually on top of it, like uh, vulnerability problems or potential problems. Vulnerability is discovered uh, because there were like uh, uh, tweets that came out because the tweets might be even faster than what the company really puts on their website, of course, because they're afraid that uh, everyone can know about it and whatsoever. But here is like people that just hear about something and they try to share the knowledge. So you go faster. Then we tried also with this uh, algorithm. We put a text from a known website, for example, which is the first one over there, uh, Arctica, Pandora, FMS, and so on. We inserted the text inside the algorithm and it will find the relevant words without even giving any rules in the beginning. And for example, it found here, on un, un, uh, unauthenticated attackers, uh, SQL injection attack session, and so on. So bas basically, it will try to find uh, what are the keywords which are related to vulnerabilities, and it's going to uh, kind of uh, send an alert to the manager of to the responsible person, so it can take care of before the damage might actually happen. So yeah, this was our second approach, and. Yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I would like also to invite my team and we can actually answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Rando. Is there any question? The team can, can go on stage, by the way. <laughs> Come on, guys, don't be shy. But wear the mask, please, if you're all on top of the stage. No question? Yeah. Thank you. What were the criteria to select the, um, the data from Twitter? You say you, you collect from Twitter, but I did not get the criteria what you chose. So we inserted uh, some text in it, so uh, text that usually is used with uh, cyber attacks or vulnerabilities or whatever, and it went to search uh, these tweets in, it was 24 hours or in the last 24 hours. So basically whatever tweets it found with these keywords, it uh, gave us uh, the result list in there. Uh, just to add, I mean, just to say that this approach was actually just to test if we could actually get the information from Twitter in which way, which kind of format we can get. And in this case, we were just um, formatting that just recent stuff that was related to the keywords vulnerability and hack, but in the same tweet. So it was not that really high, high probability because sometimes you find them maybe in different tweets, but we were just trying to understand, you know, what can be actually possible there. And the idea would be in future to have maybe like keywords that are generic ones, like vulnerability, exploit, zero day, and then add the specific software, like vendor, product, that we would get from the data on the com from the company side, so from the inventory we had. Any other question? Good, if there is no question, thank you very much for this very interesting solution and for the insightful presentation of Rando. Uh, yes, yes. Good, so now we'd like to invite on stage team three. Uh, the presenter according to the schedule is Avinash Kumar Kannan and the challenge is from Nutri Assistant.
Maybe there was a change in the presenter? Okay. Then Roit is going to present. So you will also provide feedback to yourself later as a yeah. challenge provider. <laughs> Hello. All right. So we got a challenge for ourselves. So we wanted to build, or we wanted to work with data to build a mechanism to figure out how to predict precisely recipes for people from a database of recipes and uh, other knowledge sources. So, oh. so, this was the knowledge source that we chose. So we basically took uh, information about demographics, food, and allergies from people as they onboarded the portal. Uh, we used dietary regulations for individuals. Uh, uh, it, it is differentiated by male, female, weight, age, other categories that we took from FDA. That's the Food and Drug Association. So they publish these standards. And then we brought data, because for machine learning, you basically need data, right? So we brought a lot of recipes with us. And then we followed this process. So we realized that very quickly that when we were working with a lot of recipes, we cleaned them up and everything was ready. And we had this input data about users. Uh, it was an accidental discovery that we could only, it was just like a rule kind of a system, right? Because so you have a criteria and then you have this data, data here. Uh, about people, and you can just do a rule-based kind of a mapping, and that's not really machine learning, right? So then we had to move forward and see, okay, uh, how do we do this, right? Where, where does machine learning apply in the complete data set? So then we started, uh, we started with pers persona clustering. So this is basically people with s same age group, uh, uh, same food preferences, for example, cooked, grilled, seafood, meat, Kind of, so we created a clustering with this kind of data. We applied the following mechanism to cluster the data. After that, we started collecting user feedback. So every time a recommendation was made and the person liked the recipe, we took that database and collect, start, started collecting that data. So for this purpose, because we didn't have that data, we took the recipes, we took the user profiles, and we, we generated the data for ourselves by just doing click, 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 so that we generate that data. And then we applied machine learning on basically the user behavior, where they had been presented a recipe, and they either liked it or they disliked it. And by which we built the recommendation engine, which is basically our model. And what it does, it, it takes the new incoming user it maps the, it uses the model to pick up the closest match, and then it starts recommending on day one the recipes that a, a other group with similar uh, likes had earlier liked. Is there a delay? So this is the, yeah, now I can do this, right? 
So this is the basically data we started with. This is uh, the recipe uh, database that we brought with us, which turned out to be not useful. And it became part of the knowledge base. And then this is how our data looked like. So for user A, if an incoming user fell in the group user A, then for every one that is represented here for every recipe, that was the journey that every user will follow. And similarly for user B, user C, and so on. So this was a good learning process. I assume that we brought the data so it will all work, but it didn't, so we had to figure out a way to make it work. And that's it. Any questions? Is there a question? Yeah. Um, could you please provide the microphone? Thanks. Um, so if I get it correctly, you generated random recipes in the beginning to train your model. So from the random recipes, if they say they like it, then you basically take into account to train your model. OK. So what we did is we only had the recipe database that we brought with us. And you can't do much with it. So we had the, the incoming information of a particular person, what he wanted. So there is, there is a defined uh, boundary that we had defined saying that he likes vegetarian, he likes cooked or boiled, what kind of allergies he has. So these were our criteria that we defined. With this information, we could only map or recommend the recipes. There was no... Uh, uh, machine learning really because you could just say okay he likes these kind of things so these recipes have these kind of things let's show it to him so that was the initial onboarding flow and then what we had to do is we had to develop another onboarding flow once this interaction started happening once i started getting recipes now i could either like it and use it or dislike it so this this disliking or liking data became the driving data for our machine learning algorithm, not the recipe data or the user data, right? So user data was initially like, there is a zero system on day one, and we don't have any data, so we can't make any recommendations. And then we use these two matrices, recipes as well as the, the onboarding information, and then, the, then we generated basically the behavioral data. So what was user doing with all these recipes? If he clicked and saw the recipe, then that means he liked it. And he could also explicitly go and say, OK, I don't like this recommendation. And that fed into our uh, data for uh, doing the ML part. Yeah. You're in a queue. You said that uh, you were doing clustering for the different kind of foods. Did you also cluster the different kind of um, persons? Yes. So we did two kind of clustering. So level one clustering was only uh, people, which is a very not a machine learning clustering. This is basically a clustering for us. People from the age of 35 to 45. People with uh, uh, vegan preference of food, for example, right? So, so we, we initially, that's the, that's, that's the only way we could uh, narrow down the recommendations that we were going to make, because we had no way of knowing what the user actually wants. And once these recommendations started going out, then the user had the ability to give you feedback that he likes it or he doesn't like it. And that was part of the separate behavioral data on which we actually applied machine learning to make recommendations and make user pools to, to, to replicate, uh, you can say a model basically, to replicate, uh, to see when the user is coming in, which pool is he closest to, and then use that to recommend uh, recipes. It, uh, it looks a bit more intelligent in the beginning, but the user can, with his likes and dislikes, change his own path in terms of experience. Because if we, if we recommend something and he doesn't like it, even though it worked for somebody else, we actually uh, use this new mattress and then we, st st for next recommendation or next person like that, we refine this metrics and then we start using this metrics to do further recommendations. Yeah. Thank you. 
I'm not the data science guy, so <laughs> be easy on the data science questions. <laughs> I just uh, have a question about the relation to knowledge engineering and machine learning. You showed these approaches, these two columns with knowledge engineering and machine learning. But can you give an example how you really integrate them? So how is knowledge engineering influence machine learning or something with an example? Okay, okay. Uh, so, so when we got the recipe data, we thought that this is it. Like we have the data, we have certain rules. Like we know this is our knowledge that people... Uh, with 35 years of age, with a very uh, sedentary lifestyle, let's say need uh, 1,500 calories per day. So this, this information is already available with FDA and other, other places. Similarly, the breakup for what kind of a recipe is good is also available uh, uh, at the FDA website. So this, so this was one information that we used, and there were two more. So basically, we then focused on user preferences. That was the knowledge uh, engineering part. Uh, what do users like? How can we, so for example, I like spinach, right? And I could choose multiple such vegetables or fruits. So when I make initial recommendations without using ML, I use that data to make the closest recommendation that I make, can make to a person. And there are other such data that, that we were using to, to reach there. That was the knowledge engineering part. And the, the machine learning part we basically applied, um, if we could see, uh, so, if you look, uh, what we are doing with this behavioral data is we are actually creating these cluster groups, right? So, user A, user B, this is uh, the, use, the, the journey or the path of a person with same kind of uh, likes on recipes coming with a uh, different background, right? And then, for every one that we see here is the recommendation that was made to him and he liked. And we didn't cover the dislike thing, but if there is a zero, then this recipe was not liked by the person. So when a user falls into user A category, then he follows this path, and we start making these, these specific recommendations. And that's the learning part. Good. Anyone, <clears throat> any other question? If not, then thank you very much, Roy. Thank you. Srivastava. Thank you, everyone. I don't have to do anything. Thank you. Bring it down. Good. So now we are going to have a virtual pitch from Arbeck Supernova, composed by Mona Upreti, Arun Uslu, Benjamin Vutrik. The challenge was the one proposed by uh, the Intelligent Information System Research, pitched by uh, Frieder. The presentation now or later? So now can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Can you hear me now? Yes, hello. Okay, can you share your screen? Okay, and someone need to, yeah, I think uh, you have the speaker should the webcam uh, enable. Hopefully that's it. Mm -hmm. And then we let you live now. Okay, okay. it's your yeah. turn. Go on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear us. Um, so, um, our, our topic is finding a right examiner, examiner for a thesis. Uh, we are in team four. Um, Benjamin, can you move to the next slide? 
Um, so we identified the as is process to find the right examiner, examiner for the thesis. Um, so the current process which exists in FHW is where department head uh, send list of thesis title in Google form to potential examiner and then potential examiner based on their interest or their availability, they say yes or no. Um, and this information goes to the head of department and head of department then decide on the actual assignment of examiners. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we did, we brainstormed on the idea about what data we have available uh, about the potential examiner, um, uh, what's the existing process, and is there any new ideas, and what kind of knowledge is available. So we studied on this um, uh, idea for finding the right examiner. Can you move to the next slide? Um, we thought uh, about the 2B process, uh, how it will look like. We call the new tool um, or the future tool as FTRE tool, which is finding the right uh, examiner. Um, so here we have uh, taken uh, many predictive model um, in few steps of the process. So I'll just go through this process briefly um, where First, what happened? Department head initiate the uh, the whole uh, process to find the right examiner um, for a semester, and then FTRE tool reads the data, uh, especially the thesis titles, and also it can read the research proposal. Then it goes. Uh, into reading about the list of the potential examiner, about the skills, their past assignments, um, and um, for the data, what we did here is we uh, actually took a list of potential examiner. We took the data from past assignments, and we also extract some of the data from LinkedIn profile uh, for our um, predictive analysis. And then FTRE model um, decide based on our matching criteria, which is above 50%. Uh, if it is above 50%, then FTRE tool uh, matches the examiner with the thesis and it sends the um, uh, reminder or notification to the to the uh, to the um, examiner. And uh, based on their feedback and how this interaction will happen uh, if the examiner say yes or no is through the chatbot. We are going to show you the chatbot, how it will look like in the latest slides. Um, and the chatbot will also collect the information why they said no with some rationale. Um, if more than one person is selected, which has the matching criteria about 50 percent, then FTRE um, tool will uh, suggest for an invite uh, meet meet or invite for a human discussion where department head and the two person who match the criteria above 50 percent will decide uh, who will going to examine the uh, thesis. And we divided that into different phases, how the requirement phases will look like solution phase and then the final phase. Uh, next slide. I will invite Benny here. Sure. Um, hello, everybody. So um, for the um, process implementation, we applied the um, Alteryx software, and um, I can show that directly to you in the software itself. I hope you can see it. Um, Is it here? So we basically designed this process. Um, and at the beginning, you have the input data. That's the one received from the department. And we also created, created an artificial um, skill matrix. Both of this data has been combined um, into one big table. and. Based on this table or this data, we did then our analysis. For instance, here we split the data in the test set and the um, verification data. With the test data, we um, analyzed which module is the best 
And in this case, uh, well, we compared um, three models, the decision tree, the random forest, and a third one. And for us, the decision tree was the best uh, suitable model in this case. And that's why we applied this. The goal was, as Mona said, was to define the person who is a best fit and um, that then executed within the machine learning part. When we had this module model here, the model is uh, inserted into the prediction functionality. We came um, with the data not used for the creation of the model. And we then um, were able to see um, whether that worked so far. Um, let me check. For instance, here we have on top um, the person which was actual <laughs> um, is Mayer Rolf. And our prediction in this case was indeed Mayer Rolf. However, if you if you go down, for instance, here we have a prediction from Uwe Leimstall, and indeed it have, would have been a Mark Schaffer. So I think our model is not yet perfect. It's a starting point, and um, we have to evaluate further how we can improve it, maybe if we um, use more data. Now I hand over to Harun Uslu, who um, has done something with Azure. Yes, hello everybody, here is Harun. Um, yes, uh, we uh, did not only check it with uh, Alteryx, but also with Microsoft Azure. Uh, there we used uh, the machine learning studio. Here you see on this picture, on the left hand side, you see uh, how we modeled it. And then we used two uh, multi-class models. On the right-hand side, you see uh, the multi-class decision forest, where we have an, uh, an overall accuracy uh, 0 0.42. And then uh, second, we also use a neural network multi-class model. And here we have <clears throat> the overall accuracy about 0 0.35. Um, here we see if we make a comparison that uh, the upper one, the multi-class decision forest would be uh, suitable or it would be better. Uh, just here, uh, with this Azure, we just want to show you that yeah, we can use, of course, multiple machine, learn, uh, machine learning tools. As Mona mentioned, uh, at the end of our tool, we can use a chatbot. I want to show uh, how this uh, will look like. Uh, let's say the examine, examine did not uh, or, or rejected to examine this thesis. So then the chatbot will ask why he rejected it, what was the reason? Then he can put uh, a message. He, uh, for example, he, he will write, currently I don't have enough time. <clears throat> and then the examiner will take it uh, and consider it for uh, the further examinations. This would be a uh, help and that the Examiner will no more be asked for such, or if in other cases, like he, he does not have experience in this topic, then this examiner will, it will not be asked anymore. Yeah, that's actually our, our solution. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, we're pleased to ask, uh, to, to answer the questions. Good, thank you very much, Mona, Benjamin, and Arun. One applause. Any question? 
we have a question from the head of the master in business information systems. You explained the input for your work, but I did not get it really for the topic. Do you really use the whole, uh, the full text of the master thesis to determine the topic? Uh, no, actually, you know, we just had the, the title. So what, uh, so this was the limitation. We just had the title and the examiner, um, I think two years data was available. We couldn't, we wanted to get the abstract of the thesis, uh, but we couldn't get that. And it was very difficult. So what we did, we just used the title, thesis title. Thank you. Thank you. Any further question? So if not, thanks a lot again, Mona, Benjamin, and Harun. And actually, let me allow me to, to do a small comment. It's very nice to see that many uh, of these challenges are coming, or many of these solutions are coming from the FHNW alumni. So one applause for you again. The next one. Is Tim Ticino reloaded? I would like to invite the presenter on stage. The challenge provided was Vega, and the challenge is about analyzing the a volume of ECG data. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Do I? Do I need to do anything to get the presentation up? Oh, there we go. All right. So, um, hello from Team Ticino Reloaded. Uh, we actually had the digitalization of business processes. Uh, as a group and added a few members to uh, you know, challenge ourselves with this. And we did the classification of ECG data, which was from Banuk and Vega. So, sorry, we kind of put this together very quickly at the end. Um, we wanted to think about how to improve the interpretation of ECG data, right? And we already chose this topic in advance because we were quite interested. Several of us are from medical informatics um, or we've taken medical informatics courses. Uh, so we actually did a little bit of research before we came here and um, a few of us met with a cardiologist and um, asked them about him a bit about ECGs. And he said, actually, it's quite standard that um, they use classification algorithms to uh, give a normal abnormal readout when you have an ECG. And he said a lot of young doctors may not even really be able to read an ECG properly uh, because they're relying on this uh, algorithm. But he did say that he always stresses that you really have to understand uh, the readout because depending on the patient and uh, the data, it may still be normal, but um, but abnormal for that patient. Um, so we took that into consideration when we came here. Um, and we knew then that, of course, there's algorithms versus the neural networks that are being used today. Uh, we were, of course, pleasantly surprised to find that we could use uh, cloud to maybe improve accessibility. And we considered also that, you know, an ECG is is part of the problem, but you also have to work with people. So there are doctors who are maybe not so technically savvy, uh, and so we also need to provide some uh, benefit for the, these doctors. Um, so we also considered a user-friendly website and um, potential for future an API to connect directly to the device. 
Um, so neural network models, as I was mentioning, you know, algorithms are based on norms, but of course we are not all the same, and you can't just group everyone together. Uh, but this is, of course, how currently ECGs f in the clinics are, are working. And we're also th more interested in this personalized medicine, right? So again, for you as a person, maybe your ECG looks normal, but perhaps you're older, and so actually your heart rate is kind of increased where it shouldn't be as high uh, for your age group. And uh, this was what we were interested in, patient-specific norms as an improvement. So. We played around with the data, of course. It took a while to get the data sorted and, and uh, um, understand exactly what we were looking at. Uh, in the end, we implemented a um, random forest uh, ourselves just um, with Python code, and that gave uh, about an 80% accuracy, which is okay, but not great. So we also um, went with the Azure, and uh, they actually have also models available. And Admittedly, this is not data from the end because we didn't quite get everything trained at the end, but last stand that I took was that we had this, um, this model running at an 0.98754 accuracy, which is very good. Um, we'd still need to test that and run through it. Obviously, there was not enough time for this. Um, but this would feature like a feature scaled by ap uh, maximum absolute value and it has this light GBM, which actually is more of a random forest model. It's just a sort of improved random forest model from Azure. Uh, so moving on, we also uh, thought that we would then have this, uh, the opportunity to connect this model with a website uh, and using some uh, readout so that uh, any user can just basically enter a file, submit it, and then it will analyze it based with the model that we've created and give a readout of, in this case, ECG, oh, I don't think you see anything, ECG abnormal. And the idea with this also is if you combine it with cloud, you also have to think that not all doctors have great access to, tech, you know, to everything. So if you're maybe a doctor working in Africa, you might also be able to use the cloud technology. I mean, internet at the least is by now available almost everywhere, um, that you could use, you know, if your machine breaks, that you can still upload data and, well, not, sorry, machine breaks, but uh, if the analysis isn't working or you want to double check it, you could use um, machine learning to, to test your results. So, sorry that was fairly short, but thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for making this, uh, Vanuk and Vega for providing the data, uh, Jan and Michael for their support. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Any question? Frida? Might have to. Do you see any chance to explain the uh, classification? Uh, we, we actually, we played around with it once and then we did see that there may have been an error and so we reran it again and that's why this uh, wasn't completely trained. And we would have to look into it, obviously. I, mean, I was just thinking on the last slide that you showed, mm -hmm. this says abnormal, so. Uh, yeah. Would maybe help the inexperienced doctors if they could see what's wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good yeah. feedback. Yeah, it would be good to build into. Um, I mean, with neural networks, well, with random decision or with random forest, maybe you can read out where the problem was. Um, yeah. Or, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Any other question? No? Okay, then thank you very much again to uh, Team Ticino Reloaded. <laughs> this year, sir. Good, then I would like to call on stage Team No BS, which stands for No Bullshit. Please, the presenter is welcome to come on stage. Good, Vivian, the stage is yours, please.
Hello, everyone. So we are Team No BS, short for No Bullshit, and that was in reference to the student submitted challenge concerning terms and conditions that we accept every day. Now to sort of focus, well, actually let me outline what it was. So it was to simplify what is in those terms and conditions because obviously they're far too long. Um, they're very extensive. Um, so the idea was to have a tool through machine learning that helps the everyday user to understand what actually is presented in these terms and conditions and privacy policies. Our approach <coughs> was for this proof of concept to narrow it down a bit and we selected a focus area on the privacy policies we decided to do a mixed approach of supervised and unsupervised learning. And in order to do that, we needed to create two knowledge bases. So one where we extracted the privacy policies from various different providers, and we went through and categorized them into the four categories that you can see on the right. So the sharing of data, the data localization, the contact information. So if you have questions, concerns, is there um, the um, data privacy officer contact details available? As well as can you delete the data somehow? And so we took those, put them into categories and then for the unsupervised learning, we basically just took everything, put it in one document, and that was the knowledge base for that. Let me see, did I forget something? No. <laughs> um, and then basically what we did is we converted text into numbers through embedded word, and which then leads to embedded vectors which allowed the system to give an output through the long-term, short-term memory of the categories that we provided. And this is how we feel an end solution could look like. So the user would basically download a browser extension and then whenever there's a pop-up with the privacy policies that you would have to accept. So on the top right, you can see that you have the option to review this privacy policy. And then through the categorization that we've done through the output that the model will provide, you kind of have like a traffic light system where it shows you the categories. So if it's green, for instance, with data sharing, we can see this data, uh, this company won't share or sell your data. And you can see the contact information for the digital privacy officer. But for instance, we couldn't determine where the data is stored. Or um, for the data storage, there's no um, length or it's not really stated how long it will be stored for. So yeah, that's very quick and easy <laughs> explained, hopefully. Um, but obviously, this is the dream outcome. But we would have to have a far more extensive knowledge base, which we were just at the start at. And we want to thank you at this point as well, Carmen de la Cruz, who helped us on the legal point of view for this. She went through all of the categorizations that we've made and um, checked if they were correct from a legal point of view, as well as Frieda and Stefan, who helped us quite a bit on the technical side. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask, and I'd invite Ricard as well for the technical input. <laughs> Any question? Mm. 
no question from the jury. Do we have any question? Maybe I, que I have a question. So what was the hardest part here in your challenge? I think at the beginning it was definitely trying to figure out where we should focus on and what the end goal output should be. Um, because for instance, we saw there is already an approach where they're trying to do something similar, but they're just kind of like highlighting certain areas of the um, privacy policy, but they don't really explain what it means. So for us, it was clear we wanted to go that step further in the end when we reviewed all of this to really simplify it for the user. Thank you. Maybe a follow-up question. So we talk about privacy policy. Uh, did you consider uh, the European one, GDPR, or FADP from the Swiss? We um, looked at various different ones. So for instance, some of them will have the various different countries in there, and we had all of them mostly. So we had the GDPR, but then there was, for instance, separate ones for Brazil, Mexico, um, in the US, it's interesting because there's like a specific one for California. Um, so we looked at various ones. Wow, great. Thank you very much, Vivian, again. And I would propose another applause for this team. <laughs> now we're going to have the second last team on stage, the Team Career Path fin Finder. Uh, I suppose the presenter is going to be Jose Vides. And the challenge was provided by jobaldino.ch. The stage is yours. All right, can you hear me well? So I guess that means yes. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, just to refresh, right? Like the challenge for us was uh, basically to find out um, if we can use uh, machine learning or like, um, I mean, yeah, basically knowledge engineering or machine learning uh, to make a system that can, um, let's say, predict the next career path for a person, right? Based on their profile and uh, based on data from, uh, from people with similar profiles. So, um, yeah, basically we wanted to find a system that can do this, and the question was if uh, this is possible using machine learning and knowledge engineering. And, uh, well, yeah, how we started, right? We had basically um, an Excel uh, file that had uh, data structured in, in this way. Uh, let's say it was not that already in a machine learning um, format that could be inputted, so a lot of the work was um, dedicated to that, like, you know, uh, uh, grouping some, some variables so that we could have just one uh, output variable in the end. Um, and also, like, uh, for example, here you can see we had some, some information about the different work experiences a person had, and we had to somehow consolidate this so that we could have um, a single input and, and so on, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, a large part of, uh, of the information or the, the work that we did was uh, manual work into translating this into a format that could be fit into a, an algorithm in the end. 
Uh, and uh, this is the format that we had eventually, right? Uh, it was, uh, let's say, an idea of, of, of different people that we had from uh, database from LinkedIn. It was roughly around 7,000 samples we had. Uh, we had to narrow it down to specifically FHNW um, uh, alumni, let's say that they were, uh, we had information about uh, the, their backgrounds and so on. And um, yeah, basically we, we had to uh, create a data structure like this, uh, basically using numeric variables and so on that we could then feed to an algorithm, right? Um, yeah, basically once we had it in this format, we could um, uh, feed it into Microsoft Azure. Um, we had uh, two options, basically. We could either use Azure for that or build an algorithm ourselves. Uh, in this case, we went for Azure because it was uh, because of the, the time um, restrictions. It was a, a faster solution, right? And um, yeah, I mean, let's say here we have around 16% accuracy from our um, from our model. Um, this, I think, can be explained because we have. Um, around 30 input variables, and we have around, I don't know, 100 uh, something different uh, industry categories. So our input variables were, for example, um, uh, with the, the years of experience that you have, um, the education that you, made in, in, that, that you had in, in which uh, study field, and the output was uh, basically in which industry this person was working, right? And because there were so many different industries, it was, uh, let's say that's, I think, why there is uh, such a low, low accuracy, but uh, yeah. Basically, we, we couldn't include more, more variables because it was a lot of manual work to, uh, to process this, right? Um, uh, actually, a good uh, result of this, I think, was um, that my original idea was to use a, a, a neural network. But uh, after using Azure, I could see that the algorithm with the highest accuracy was in the end random forest. <laughs> so that was an interesting uh, output from this. And uh, yeah, we also, uh, one of the goals was to, let's say, deploy it in the end that we could use it with, uh, with an application and, uh, and give an interface. But uh, yeah, it would be basically for the time restrictions, we weren't able to do this. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the part of the machine learning side. Um, now I will hand on uh, to Jan so that he can explain how we will integrate this with uh, knowledge engi engineering. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, for sure, we also tried to include uh, the knowledge part, right? So uh, we had different experts uh, uh, who contributed to these solutions. Uh, to this solution, so we tried to basically use Neo4j for that, but um, we, we failed uh, due to time constraints and time issues. So we started to implement some rules uh, manually and then uh, started with top braid uh, to editor uh, uh, rules and, and the classifications uh, uh, to start with it. Um, but we were close to really uh, try to combine those two things. We did not get it until the end, but um, I think we can take a lot of uh, inputs uh, out of it for the next steps, which is basically uh, to integrate those two parts, AI solution and knowledge engineering, uh, into uh, a shared web service to verify uh, the solutions uh, the AI solution uh, is, is uh, spitting out in the end, uh, verified by a rule-based system, but also verified, for example, by uh, coaches, career coaches, transfer services uh, to really use uh, the output of uh, the AI solution to further improve uh, the coaching, for example. And yeah, uh, as Jose already said, it's it's uh, good first steps are already done, and we tried to further develop uh, the model, uh, yeah, to integrate more input and, of course, then also more output fields. So, feel free to ask if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose and Jan. Any question? Not too many, please. Yes, uh, thanks for providing the mic. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, so it seems like you, you lost a lot of time to clean up, prepare your data, right? Why, I was just wondering why you didn't use any, another data set that is ready so you can focus on your main work and not just lose so much time cleaning the data and preparing it? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, 
after two days, yeah, it's a good input. We, had, we should have done it right this way. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, basically that's what we had. And uh, from our side, from challenge provider side, it was not basically, uh, how can I say, the awareness was not uh, that high, basically. So we, yeah, it was trial and error in the end. So there was no specific reason to use this particular date as input, right? Because I, no. okay. I, I think we also underestimated the, the amount of time we will use for that. I, we thought it would be faster, let's say, this uh, consolidation of all the variables and, uh, yeah, we'll have a little bit more time for, for this uh, actual task of building, building the models and so on, right? So, yeah. Um, you have used uh, as an output. You you got sixteen percent of accuracy, right? And yes. this was with a subset of all the features, or um, did you try different set of features? No, um, basically. So we had one output variable that was uh, the um, the industry where people were working. Uh, we tried to narrow it down so that we didn't have, we had like many different, uh, very sparse uh, output uh, variable, let's say, right? Like uh, there were, I don't know, maybe 7,000 people, I don't know, maybe 5,000 different uh, variables. And this was because people like they make typos and they make uh, different uh, ways of writing uh, uh, an industry, right? Um, so we tried to narrow it down. We, this was manual work, basically, right? That's why we also didn't include more input variables, because each input variable would require manual work, and we didn't have the time to, to process all this data, right? Um, but I think that that's the reason for the low accuracy. We had around 30 input variables and 190 different uh, industries. So let's see, you can have one input variable that is mapped to different, uh, different industries, right? Then you cannot have a higher accuracy, so yeah. Yeah, thanks. All right. <laughs> Other question? No? Okay, then thanks again, Jose and Jan. Thank you. An applause. Very good, very good. So now we are approaching the last pitch. This is going to be virtual. It will be held by Hans Müller from Team Indaja, who implemented the challenge letter of credit provided by Bura Ablak. So Hans, we can see your uh, PowerPoint at the moment. Uh, is that intended? Oh, wait a second. Can you say something again? Hans? Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry? Yes. Ah, perfect. Yeah. But we see your yes. PowerPoints. Yeah, exactly. So I will start with the PowerPoints and then switch to the application, just to give a small overview of what we have Okay. Done. So we don't see the, the slides full screen. We see your application. Ah, okay. Do you see it now full screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, you can, okay, perfect. can start. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, what we have done now, uh, we have actually worked a bit on on, uh, on 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 how to extract actually the letter of credit, right? From from what we have uh, received, right? From Buda, uh, it has been quite successful. Uh, we have used uh, different models. One of them obviously has been TensorFlow, right? Uh, together with uh, with um, uh, the Azure tools uh, from uh, from machine learning, right? Uh, we have also predicted the categories, the items via categorization. We have used uh, some parts of regression analysis, uh, decision trees, to allow us actually to detect that uh, certain uh, areas in more detail. And well, so far we have been successful at least on, on getting the tags, uh, the, the main areas of, of each of each uh, layer of credit, and also to to compare it right against what we believe it should be actually the uh, the control, right? 
Um, so uh, I will switch now briefly to the application so that you can have a look. One second. Exactly. So what we have done, for example, for uh, for this order, right? Uh, we have used uh, first uh, the OCR process from uh, Azure, right, to extract uh, the coordinates of, of the document, right, and then afterwards we have used uh, and what what I have uh, already explained, right, part of uh, TensorFlow, right, to 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 find then uh, the categories and and, and obviously the uh, the fields, the relevant fields for us, right, in in every in every uh, delivery order. And what we have done afterwards was actually to compare that to the letter of credit, right? And uh, based on that, right, I mean, given the short time, uh, we haven't had actually much more time to, to, to develop it fully. But we expect, obviously, in, in a couple of days more, right, to have done a, 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 um, a workable version of, uh, of, of, the, of the lecture of the letter of credit. I mean, this process obviously will automate, uh, automate then, uh, fully the whole process, right? I mean, it will be uh, proof error. I mean, it will have really a low, a low rate of, uh, of mistakes compared to human, uh, human prone errors. And uh, it will enable all as well, right, to to uh, to anticipate and to, to facilitate and uh, the training between uh, between entities and companies uh, in in such a way, right? And um, well, the, the rest is just uh, built in in, uh, in JavaScript. So <laughs> this is just a small example, but uh, uh, this is most, more or less the process we have been following during the last two days. So that's most, more or less it. That's it. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Hans. Mm -hmm. Any question? No question. Maybe one question from my side, Hans. So I mm -hmm. see the OCR working. I didn't see that the, the, the matching was done, but you mentioned that the matching was happening. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So basically, so basically, sorry. Yes, you can answer. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, basically what happens is, yeah, of course, I mean, we have extracted down the data from here automatically, and then afterwards uh, the system has been matching it uh, with, with, uh, with the relevant uh, papers, right? I mean, we, we don't see that part because we couldn't actually show it here, right, nicely, but, uh, but this, it works ex uh, exactly in the same process, right? So it will extract information, the relevant information, and we match it down to, to, the, to the contracts, for example. Yeah, no, that, that's the point. That I see the extraction. I, uh, I, I, I don't see the comparison. Is this the comparison still a manual work? Uh, no, no, the, the comparison won't be a manual work, obviously. I mean, the system will actually, uh, based on that, right, because this was actually extra, uh, this part was extracted automatically by the system, right? Uh, the whole, the, the rest of the process is also automatic, right? So it will actually match it one to one to, to whatever the layer of create says, and then it will then uh, provide them the final results. Can you prove that? But, yeah, just. Can you prove that that this uh, works, this matchmaking? Um, yeah, actually, yes. I mean, we can submit that the, the information to you because, as I mentioned, right, we didn't have the time to put it nicely in in the, in the application, as you see. So uh, we couldn't actually put it here so the people to see. But we can actually submit them the the the, the, doc, the documents, right? I mean, the results and the code. Okay, no, no, it was just a question to better understand the state uh, that you reached so far. Obviously, uh, it, within two days, we cannot have high expectations. Could also be that some part was left for future work. And meanwhile, they would, uh, this discussion has triggered another question. Uh, yeah, hi, Hans. So I was wondering, how, what is the accuracy of this OCR? Have you, what is your experience so far? Yeah, I mean, basically, it, it will depends, right? Uh, for example, when we talk about uh, matching, for example, certain types of documents, which we know already, for example, the, the structure of the of the information we are getting, I mean, it's, it will be pretty high. I mean, if we are done talking about unstructured uh, information, uh, it will still be high, but probably around 70 to 80 percent, right, accuracy, not not much more. 
right? because it will be then difficult for the system to understand. So 80 percent you mentioned. 80 percent in this is the lower the low uh, the low case high case is uh, around 90 to 95 percent. I think in this case, for example, for layer of credits is much higher because we know that uh, the, what, what kind of information are we looking for, right? So we know the structure of the information. So the the Azure um, implementation um, has this feature, right, to to basically know or or provide the structure as an input, so you can get better accuracy. Exactly. All right. There is uh, there is this model in uh, in Azure, right, which uh, allows you to do that. Uh, obviously, you have to work on it because uh, I mean the data you are looking at probably is not always the same, and yeah, files uh, and the documents can also have a different layout, right. And just a final question. So if you would go to that, let's say, in production, how would you handle this uh, uh, loss of accuracy, this 5%, right? Would you have on top of that like a, a manual checking process? Because letter of credit is some, something serious, right? It's not a receipt that just can go away. Exactly. So actually, the system works the other way around. So it will start actually flagging those which are which doesn't uh, which be, the system believes are not correct, right? And those are the ones which are then being uh, being uh, done and submitted then to manual review, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So this this increases this increases the amount of work, uh, the decreases the amount of work, but I mean obviously there is still some certain uh, amount of uh, human interaction at the moment. Um, did you use uh, the OCR cognitive services uh, API from Azure? And how much, if if yes, how many uh, samples have you uploaded there? And and how how was the result from that? Yeah, I mean we we started using the OCR from um, uh, from Azure, right? Uh, we have I mean we we had actually a, a lot. Uh, a lot of the documents, so we submitted around 20. We probably will have submitted much more, but uh, we combined that this part of, of, of the extraction of Azure with our own technology, so uh, that, that also increases the, I mean, reduces the amount of development, but increases also the accuracy rate. I mean, in, in, in overall, I mean, I mean the, the, the system of Azure, is, it, it seems to be working quite well. I mean, not perfect, but good. And, uh, and and yeah, it seems to 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 have delivered at least with a few samples a good results, right? Which is surprising, I would say. Yes, I I'm just wondering about only having eighty percent recognition rate because I I thought that the OCR service is quite good, so that you recognize ah, no, no, much more. No, no, sorry, but, but we are not talking here about the OCR recognition, right? I mean, OCR recognition obviously is quite high. I mean, what I mean is just to parse the data. I mean, to get, for example. Uh, that the system recognizes the number here, for example, or the name, or, or you know, the, really in a really accurate way. You know, it will say address, and it will actually get down the address, not just any random information. Uh, that's that's what I mean with 80%. But or, overall, I mean, obviously, they recognize 100% of the of, of the letters and characters. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. All right. Good. Thanks, Hans. And Thanks. I, 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 yeah, I would, I would invite to have another applause. I think. Um, so my proposal. We are a <clears throat> we are running a little bit behind the schedule. So now my proposal would be, uh, and I see also a little bit uh, that we we need some some fresh air and we need a little bit of uh, break. So I would propose now that we stop and we we see us again at half past six we are going to restart with the statements from the challenge provider so just something quick like it can be a couple of minutes for each challenge provider uh, whether you liked how the, the 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 team implemented the challenge whether you see some further development on that and so on so see you in a bit We can we can start enjoying the apero in the atrium. Meanwhile,
Yeah. Uh, no, no. Make it on, make it on, yeah. yeah. Uh. Sa, prova. A little bit of suspense. Are you ready for the very final session of this Megaton 2020? Yes? <laughs> Did you drink enough beers or not yet? Okay, we can continue later on. Good, then, as we said, before, we would like to have very short statements from the challenge providers. Obviously, the challenge providers that already were here on stage presenting could also avoid to, to do that because they were helping uh, jointly the, the programmers. So I'm referring to assistant nutrist, for example, and also uh, to the career path finder, right? And uh, But the rest are invited here on stage to say a short sentence. So I would like to invite uh, some represent representative from Vega. If there is still someone here, perfect. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just say so. Please. So I just uh, speak quickly for Jan actually because he had to leave, and it's about the ECG. Uh, data and um, he just told me that you actually did a very good job and I'm happy for that. And um, as I'm not so was not so deeply involved in it, um, I can say still that um, um, I think you you um, were probably uh, thinking uh, as a or you you thought about doing uh, creating a whole product because you also create thinking about the web app and you thought about uh, um, in advance before you even started, so you talk to, to, to doctors, so it's very impressive that you did this effort. I think this was very positive from our side. Um, maybe technical stuff I cannot say so much, but maybe it would be also uh, good, but this was already mentioned, um, that you could give some feedback. Um, I think this was also mentioned by the raters about the, what, what, what the problem could be. Mm. And finally, maybe it would be also interesting to look into other uh, algorithms, um, not only the random forest classifier, f classifier as I understood you only used. Um, with the Microsoft Azure, I'm not sure um, what this thing is actually doing. It's a bit of a black box for me. I don't know how much you can look into this. This, this I cannot judge. Yeah. So thank you. That's the that's feedback from our side. Thank you very much. So now, meanwhile, we establish connection with Andrea from Italy directly, from Genova University, if I'm not mistaken. So, Andrea, are you ready? Yep. Okay, Maybe. you can go on. So, hi guys, hello again. Um, we would like to say a big thank you again for considering our challenge. And this Megaton has truly been a good opportunity for us all and we hope for you as well. So to begin with, we, we would like to notice that you have achieved really good results, especially considering the time constraint and the amount of data that you were dealing with. So. All of your considerations done in the presentation were right. 
Uh, in the next days, we will analyze your approach and your results in details uh, so that we will give you additional feedback. So thanks for sharing with, with, with us your code too. Uh, moreover, we have appreciated your comments on, on our data set because we already knew that the fact that the considered subjects were all young males uh, and it was surely a negative side of it. Uh, and the reason is that we have recorded data in our department, particularly during the last months and therefore during the pandemic months. Uh, so it has been really difficult to find volunteers for our study. So you can imagine the effort uh, for obtaining an heterogeneous data set regarding gender, age, etc. And the one thing we'd like to point out is that it is an ongoing work. So we have previously analyzed an activity recognition approach by ourselves, uh, and we have the perspective to include way more subjects in, in the next months in, in the data set, possibly with, with uh, elderly people and with others suffering uh, from mobility impairment. So we also have uh, a proposed paper that needs to be accepted and approved, and we'll be happy to share it with uh, with you to compare our results. That is why we'd like, we'd like also to say that um, should anybody be interested in this topic or on our data set in general, uh, just contact us via, via email and we will keep you updated on both new version of our data set or on the results that uh, we will obtain. So thank you again and wish you good luck for everything, guys. Perfect, thank you very much, Andrea. So now I would like to invite some representative from PostFinance. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to make it quick. I'm sure you all want to go home. Um, first, I was really glad that there was a team rising to our challenge, and then they failed, about which I was really glad, because so did we, with a lot more time and a lot more people. In the end, we got a lot of inputs and other approaches that we could try, so I'm really glad they tried, and we have good input, and uh, that's why they kind of deserved a little Raspberry Pis <laughs> for trying the challenge. Um, it was a really nice event. Um, and good luck on your future paths, whatever you do. Thank you. So now I would like to invite Frieder. Frieder is a representative of our research group, Intelligent Information Research Group. Okay, I hope the group hears me online. So I uh, want to say a big thank you, and I think uh, I particularly like the the process that you set up, that the, this to be process, which I think is really something we can take inspiration from. Uh, I particularly like this, uh, let's say, feedback loop, and also including the idea <clears throat> how we can actually not only learn who's the right examiner, but also learn why people say no and, and, and feed that back into a machine learning approach. Well, mentioning that machine learning approach, uh, in the end, I think, um, I mean, I was with you and uh, <laughs> you tried not one, not two tools, but three, maybe four, I don't remember. But um, uh, yeah, so, it didn't quite work out, but um, I think that uh, hopefully, or I believe, you learned a lot, and I think that's that's also a very very important aspect here. So thanks again for for your efforts. Thank you very much, Frida. Great. So now, I let's finish this round. I, I like this feedback. Let's let's also get to know what uh, the challenge providers uh, of that also participated into the, or were involved into the development of the uh, challenge thing. So I would like to invite, uh, respecting the order of the presenters, I would like to invite Rohit to talk a little bit about the, yeah, just one short sentence, Rohit, about uh, how the team performed.
finished? Ah, okay, good. So for those following from home, Rohit is very happy about the performance of the programmers and very happy also about this organization and the event. Thank you very much, Rohit. The next one that I would like to invite is Katinka Prikril to say something. Yes, uh, could you please come here? No? Too tired? Thank you. So I also try to make it quick. I am really proud of my team. Actually, I came with no expectations that they've chosen my challenge was not a surprise, but yes, it was a surprise because in the beginning I was just sitting there alone and somehow uh, we just uh, met each other and we came from very different backgrounds. Everyone could contribute something of his own value and we're so different characters and somehow we just really joined our, our spirits. We were very driven and they showed a lot of uh, engagement. So because I had no expectations where this was going actually and what um, experts or anyone could come up with as a solution, uh, what they came up with, uh, I'm just really proud. So it was a first step of a first step, of course, but uh, everyone needs to start somewhere. So thank you so much. Cool, thank you very much. So heartfelt. This comment, I love it. More and more. I would like that this session never ends, actually. I'm enjoying it so much. Now, the last one is Jan. Please, Jan, come on stage and say something about <laughs> this handover. So, yeah, first of all, a big thanks to Jose, who uh, yeah, joined our team. So he had uh, a really big effort. He, uh, he worked like a lot <laughs> and contributed also a lot to the solution. So thank you very much, Jose. And thanks for the organization here. Uh, make it quick. Have a nice evening. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. So hopefully this, we will hear more and more about this solution in the future, also from jobalino.ch. Now I would like to invite also someone that is not physically here, but has been listening all the pitching sessions and uh, is actually also very proud of you. Uh, this person is a friend of ours. Uh, so, Uttam Tripathi is his name, working for Google, head of DevOps, and he would like to say something to you all. So, Uttam, now it's your turn. Awesome. Uh, great. I hope you all can hear me. I'm assuming that's a yes. Uh, first of all, uh, Thanks to the, the team, uh, the, make, the Megaton team for organizing this amazing event. Uh, we've all been missing sitting together uh, and, and hacking and working on projects. And I think this was an excellent opportunity to do that. Uh, I really enjoyed watching all the pitches. Uh, each of the teams had put in a lot of effort, a lot of uh, interesting solutions were presented. So that really stood out. Uh, there are two thoughts that I want to leave all of you, and I don't want to uh, take too much of your time because I know there's, there is some great drinks and beer waiting for everyone. The first one is, as we are working on solutions, uh, especially when it comes to AI and machine learning, uh, your algorithm, you can optimize it to a certain level, but really what really makes a difference at the end of the day is the data that you have the data that you're using for your training models, for building those prediction uh, uh, systems, that's critical, that's important. So in the initial stages, yes, I think optimizing for the algorithm uh, is important, 
but you can only optimize it to a certain level. What really distinguishes uh, a better performing system versus a suboptimal system is the data that you use. So that's one thing I, I want to share uh, with all of you or leave uh, with all of you. And then I want to also quickly share this uh, with all of you. And, and these are a set of AI principles that, that we at Google have published uh, some time ago. Uh, but I think this is applicable not just for Google, when Google is building solutions using AI and machine learning, but for, for everyone uh, out there. Uh, some of these would be obvious, like for example, be socially beneficial. Each of the solutions that we saw today was creating a uh, very positive utility uh, in, in its user's life. So that was really there. Uh, the second one is important, and this is the this is the place where I would encourage, uh, as some of these teams will take their solutions forward and will try to roll it out. Uh, there is a lot of bias that exists in our daily lives, uh, be it bias around gender, be it bias around uh, background, be it bias around ethnicity, and various other factors. Now, if we are using historically biased data to train prediction models, uh, the predictions those systems will make will continue to be biased. So what can we do to avoid at the first place creation of those unfair biases through our systems and then reinforcement of that? The questions to ask is, is your data really representative of the, uh, the final user uh, set that your application will be used for? Uh, and if the answer is no, that you need to go back to your drawing board uh, and spend more time uh, fixing it. Uh, building and testing for safety. In this case, a lot of these applications start to look at sensitive uh, parts of uh, individual's life. There was a solution built around healthcare. There is a solution around job employment. Uh, there are also solutions being built around financial uh, data. All of that is important for individuals. So how, as much as we can focus on uh, bringing in safety, uh, in the data that we're using, that's, that's important. Uh, fourth is more important for a large company like Google, I would say, be accountable to people. Uh, it is applicable for everyone who's building a solution, but I think the onus is a lot more on, on larger companies. Um, privacy is, is critically important. Uh, the solution that we are putting out there as AI and machine learning community, is it really lifting the, the, uh, the level of scientific research. And this was really impressive for me to see today how, how much many of the solutions that were presented were grounded in solid technical uh, research uh, and scientific uh, research. I think this is because uh, FHNW and, and the community over there has spent uh, time focusing in this area and has built a name for it. So these are some of the AI principles I want to leave this group with as many of you will be taking your solutions forward. Uh, and, and taking them to market. Uh, with that, those were my thoughts. And uh, I wish all of you all the best for your next steps on this. If any one of you decide to use Google as part of your solutions in future, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can contact me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, uh, and stay in touch. Uh, and with that, all the best. And I'll hand it back to Emanuele. Cool, thank you very much, Uttam. One applause to Uttam, I would say. We would be glad to, to have even Google as a partner for the next Makeathon, why not? We are open for yeah. all kinds of technology. This year, this, year, this year was just so tricky, like with COVID and everything, uh, but given the, uh, what's happening here this year, why not? Let's try, let's keep the conversations open for next year. Perfect, thank you very much once again. So now, finally, we are, at the end of the day, we reached one of the most awaited part, maybe, for some of you. The best Make It On 2020 award. Can we display this slide here?
something is hmm? so there is a little bit of delay let's try to find the error Good, okay. Can find the hero. I think things should be enough, right? Otherwise, we spend too much time. So, best Megaton award. Um, what happened? Are you? These are the last jokes of the Megaton 2020. So, now, please. Finger back. All right, good. So it, it's been a very long discussion within the jury. So I was proud to be part of the jury together with Professor Knut, Friede, uh, Stefan, Andreas. It was not easy at all. All of you did a great job. Uh, we were thinking maybe within 10 minutes to finish the job, not possible. It was like 40 minutes it took us. We've discussed about these three different criteria relevant to the selected challenge, inno innovation, is it innovative or not, and how it is embraced the machine learning and knowledge engineering part. Maybe I wait a bit, because otherwise those who are at home will miss this. We will improve. This is our first maker that we will improve. <laughs> it will never end this day. <laughs> Shall I do it? Quickly? Good, let's see if we can resume this session. No? Yes? Oh, wow, we are back. Here we are. It was a joke. We didn't. <laughs> so a few technical issues. We are back. So I was saying that we, it was quite challenging to choose the best Make It 2020 award. We've been... Uh, really careful in analyzing all the solution and looking at the three, these three criteria. Uh, at the end, we had to choose, we had to choose one winner, right? So, the winner is Let me check if it, yeah, I think it's this one. I don't want to make mistakes. Huh? The winner is Actigraph. So please come on stage, Andreas Juglik, <laughs> Yomi Yumudi, Gurmit Sandu, Marco Guimares. And hopefully now we also have a song, something like, no, no we don't have any song. We are the champion, my friend. I, I'm going to sing for you. Uh, these are the certificates here, also for the remaining two. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your commitment and your effort. And those are the certificates, and plus on top of it, we would like to invite you to attend training programs and 
coach coaching sessions in our new Impact Lab that we start in a few weeks. You will be informed about that. So if you are interested, you are more welcome, most welcome to to start this innovative journey with us. Good. So now. <laughs> There is also a certificate of attendance for each of you. Uh, from my side, many thanks again. It was a fantastic experience. And I would like to once again, let me see if I can show something now. Ah, is it there or no? Good. Good. I would like to thank again our sponsors who supported us throughout these two days. So PostFinance, IPT, Vega, Indaja, Secpire, De La Cruz, and Barenac. It was very nice of you to support us, and hopefully you will still be uh, next to us in this uh, new journey. I would like to Also, thanks to my fantastic team. So thank, thanks a lot to Knut, Frieder, Andrea, Stefan, David, Charuta, Maya for the amazing job that you've been doing so far. Like the, it was just perfect. So, and, uh, and obviously the last thing goes to, to all of you, the makers. Without you, we couldn't have made this. So it was. You've done an excellent job, and I hope really that you learned something, and obviously you did. And I hope that this new, this Mechaton also stimulated you. So to be even more curious towards this AI, towards the capabilities that uh, this AI has, reflecting on the drawbacks and trying to, to, to improve it day by day. So. From our side, there is the promise of trying to create this loop from the research side, where we have this MAKE symposium, IEEE in Stanford, and the other hand, the MAKEATON, where we can really put into practice what we learn from the symposium, and then creating this loop from industry to research, really to help tackling challenges of companies. Thank you very much once again, and have a beautiful week ahead. So before leaving, you find all the certificates in front. Here, please fetch one. Frieder is showing them. <laughs>